This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So now let me uh, provide a brief introduction to uh, the work of the UC Faculty Climate Action Champions. The champions from across the UC system who you'll meet today are doing some incredible work to accelerate the shift to carbon neutrality, not only in their own institutions, but also in society more broadly. And as you listen to them today, realize that these 10 people represent only a small fraction of the faculty ingenuity and creativity that we have in this incredible UC system focusing on these issues. It's a busy time, so when the Climate Action Champions came to us earlier with this, the idea for this Carbon Slam project, uh, the Faculty Engagement and Education Working Group gladly took it on. And you can read about these efforts on a website, and it, the address is very simple. Uh, it's Climate Champions, all one word, Climate Champions dot ucop, ucop .edu. so that's climatechampions.ucop.edu and I encourage you to check it out and sign up to get involved. So let me introduce the first of these climate action champions. Each campus selected their 2016 champion not to reward past work but rather to lift up one visionary and forward-looking project for new work. New work that in many cases as you'll see combines scholarship with engagement and teaching for impact. And Ariane Tehrani who's from UC San Francisco, is de developing a new curriculum for health professionals that takes into account sustainability issues on health. She believes an important first step is defining the impact of the environment on health, as well as the impact of the healthcare industry on the environment. So I welcome to the podium, please, Dr. Ariane Tehrani. So thank you all for giving me the opportunity to come share um, the project that I proposed as the faculty development, as the faculty climate champion project. Um, the project focused on development of a health professions curriculum on environmental sustainability and health for all health professions. What I am going to do is I'm going to talk specifically about the case of medicine because I've been able to accomplish the most there. However, the other professions are in progress, and I'll touch upon that a little bit. Um, I also want to acknowledge, I have had a group of collaborators who have been very key to this, so I want to acknowledge their role as well in this project. Um, so health professionals will be called upon to bear, <clears throat> to care for patients who bear the burden of disease from the impact of climate change and ecologically irresponsible practices. In addition, these professionals will work within the wasteful high eco footprint healthcare system, which still really has to embrace a culture of responsibility and hasn't done so. Um, so our healthcare professionals really are in a position to move health and healthcare towards a culture of greater ecological responsibility and as a consequence, improve patient and public health. But these professionals must first be able to recognize the connection between sustainability and health and their responsibility and capacity as healthcare professionals in changing the status quo. So with that in mind, and I think Tom said it very nicely, is that education, we defined education on environmental sustainability and health as education about the impact of environment on health as well as education about the impact of health, the healthcare industry on the environment. This is just a general snapshot of what curriculum in this area looks like. There really isn't very much. Uh, much of what's out there in the health professions is really elective material, very few core content that deals with climate, sustainability, and health. Uh, most of the work today has been done in medicine and in nursing. Um, in pharmacy, dentistry, and physical therapy, these are the schools that I'm focusing on because those are the schools at UCSF. Um, the work really has been primarily globally on sustainable clinical care provision, but not really 
transcended into education. So there's a varying amount of work that needs to be done in each of the professions to put together this curriculum. So the aim of this project was to develop I will refer to it as ESH, so Environmental Sustainability and Health Curriculum for the health professions, and I will focus on medicine and what's been done to, the, to date. I am in the School of Medicine as well, so some of my clout there has made it easier to get more accomplished. Um, to develop this curriculum, um, we drew on a curriculum development model proposed by Kern and colleagues, and I'm not going to go into great detail other than to show you that there's four steps involved in developing a curriculum to develop a systematic curriculum, identifying needs, considering what the objectives should be, focusing on educational strategies that work best, and then actually implementing it and evaluating the curriculum and refining it. So in medicine, for the first three steps, um, to develop the needs, which was the very first step, we drew on what was existing in the literature. Um, in the United Kingdom, the General Council has uh, put together a group of academics and community physicians and students who have actually uh, developed a set of priority learning objectives that all uh, medical students and medical, uh, even postgraduate medicine should draw on. So we actually took those objectives and we supplemented those with the UCSF Academic Senate Committee on Sustainability objectives that were developed about a decade ago to create a comprehensive set of 21 objectives that we then wanted to validate. And so we did so through a modified Delphi process, which I'm happy to share with you greater details about if you're interested post this discussion. But what we did was we sent the objectives out to experts identified globally um, who were in the academic commu or community setting. And we asked them to rate the importance of each objective. And then the timing within the medical education continuum, so starting from pre-medical school, pre-medical, all the way until postgraduate training that these objectives should be taught. In the third phase, we interviewed um, also experts as well as students um, on how to teach and where to introduce each of these objectives into the curriculum. Um, very briefly, I'm not going to go into great detail on this. Like I said, I'm happy to talk about the with any of you the details greater post this. But we uh, found that of our 21 objectives, 15 of them achieved um, a statistic which indicated that they were acceptable for inclusion in curriculum, in the medical, um, medical education curriculum. We classified all of these objectives, all 21 of them, into the three sort of broad areas that were defined by the UK Sustainable Healthcare Education Network. So the very first area was the doctor, a scholar, or scientist. So that's a physician's ability to be able to describe how the environment and human health interact at different levels. All the objectives in this area were deemed as critical and were included as a part of those that we would move forward with. In the second phase, uh, in the second group of objectives, those focused on doctor as practitioner. So the physician being able to demonstrate the knowledge and skills needed to improve environmental sustainability of health care systems. And the third area was doctor as professional. Um, that's the ability of the physician to be able to discuss how the duty of a doctor to protect and promote health is shaped by dependence of human health on the local and global environment. And you can see the objectives that fall into these. Um, the six objectives that didn't make it into this final sort of round of objectives belong to the last two categories. And in terms of statistics, it wasn't that they were deemed unimportant, but they just didn't quite make the cut. In terms of timing in medical education, our experts noted that there really wasn't an exclusive time to teach this content, that it really should kind of come back over and over again through a spaced education uh, type of training. There were some times that were deemed um, important or better than others to teach certain content. So for example, um, we had an objective that was the mechanisms by which human health is affected by environmental change. And 50% of our experts felt that that would be best taught in the preclinical years of medical education. Um, the preclinical years, um, for those of you who are not familiar with, with this, are actually the first one and a half to two years of medical school, depending on the school that you're at. And um, they're primarily classroom based, although some of that is shifting, but it's primarily classroom based. That was seen as the most important time to include some of this content and the actual definition of environmental sustainability and what it means to be sustainable, experts felt was a prerequisite to entering medical school. So that really does lend 
uh, validity to this discussion of how it's important, like Tom said, how it's important for our learners to be able to completely understand what all of these concepts are. In terms of educational strategies, our um, experts felt that the best way to include this content would be uh, to build linkages between existing curriculum, that there really isn't much new that needs to be done, but that the content needs to be uh, emphasized and placed in the context of what's already being taught. So for example, when teaching our medical students microbiology, that would be an opportune time to talk about how the spread of disease is altering with shifts in climate. Um, the local context was seen as critical to helping our learners learn. So one of the things suggested was, for example, experiential learning, field trips into the community to see how climate and environmentally irresponsible practices have impacted health. And then finally, building partnerships with existing groups. So for example, in the community or in an academic setting or with the healthcare system was seen as very important to this education. Uh, one of the recommendations made was building partnership with our Center for High, um, high Value Care. Uh, this is a group that focuses on providing quality care at the same time minimizing waste. And so that kind of linkage would be very critical to education. Um, instructional strategies, again, the preclinical years were seen as critical. Many of our participants felt that that's when students are the most eager. And so really helping them understand the impact of climate on health and, and presenting that framework to them was very important. Um, embedding it into existing small group work or clinical practice was seen as fine to do. There just was a sort of a sense that there should be a single unifying lecture that brings it all together and helps place for the learner in context what all this information is. Um, two other suggestions were building personal stories. Um, personal compelling stories into the education of our learners and then leaving our learners with actionable steps with which they can move forward as health professionals and alter the course of what they do. In terms of implementation, um, it has worked uh, very well in the School of Medicine because we are entering a whole new curriculum starting in the fall of 2016. I've been able to work with the course leadership to have this content included. And I've targeted primarily content leaders, um, certain areas, infectious diseases, organ systems, life cycles, even um, clinical skills instruction. Um, for example, to take an occupational and environmental history and how to best do that. Um, to include this information in their curriculum starting in the fall. Uh, we are starting a new sort of thread of the curriculum. It's being called the inquiry curriculum. It focuses primarily on teaching our medical students about what's at the a science that's at the edge. So what, where are the things that we still don't know much about in caring for patients? And climate change really fits very opportunely in the inquiry thread. And so there will be a small group that will be devoted primarily to climate change and health. And there will be a lecture that will bring this all together um, for our learners. All this is set to occur for our first year medical students in the March of 2017. And finally, um, we will be running what's going to be called an inquiry mini course, which is an elective, essentially, for our learners. And it actually capitalizes on an elective that a few of our medical students created a, a couple of years ago and ran in January of 2017. And so with that in mind, um, we're hoping to make this critical content beyond UCSF available to others, institutions to guide their work. Um, the School of Pharmacy is the school that we've been working with next to sort of get their curriculum figured out, nursing and then dentistry and physical therapy. Thank you very much for your time. Hi everyone, I'm Sherry Briggs and I'm um, representing UC Santa Barbara because UCSB's climate, uh, climate, faculty climate champion couldn't be here, uh, Gretchen Hoffman. But if Gretchen was here, what she would talk about would be engaging undergraduates and creating a team of outreach specialists on climate issues uh, important to the California coast. So what I'm gonna use my really short presentation to talk about is a couple of multi-campus initiatives that are very much aimed at harnessing the power of all 10 campuses um, uh, pertaining to climate change. And well, they're relevant to climate change, not completely about climate change. The first one of them is a new initiative that we're starting up on coastal health as part of the UC Global Health Institute. Um, the UC Global Health Institute is aiming towards, once again, harnessing the power of the 10 campuses to improve health, health and achieving equity in health for all people worldwide. 
And so far, um, the concept of global health has been very much people-centric. It's all, been all about improving health, uh, human health. And it's true that over the last de uh, um, uh, century or so, there have been incredible improvements in the health and well-being of many people, most people worldwide. Um, but most of these improvements have really come, come at the cost to degrading the natural systems that support human health and support basically health on the planet. And so uh, the UC Global Health Institute is now moving into the area of planetary health, which is the, the cool, new, cool new phrase. What it is, it's global health, but now taking into account that, um, that uh, we really need to not just improve human health. Human health has been so far been very much bought at the cost of degrading the natural systems. We need to include those natural systems in, in the concept of human health. And so at UCSB, um, we're just now starting a new initiative on coastal health in collaboration with the, the UC Global Health Institute. And why coastal health? Um, it turns out that about 50% of humans on Earth are distributing themselves on, on these very narrow stretches of, of coastline. Um, and about something like 75% of the new megacities are on the coastlines. And we congregate along the coast for a number of reasons. We're making use of many goods and services that the, the, uh, the marine environment supplies, um, food, uh, um, the industry along the, along the coast. We make use of the cooling aspects of water, uh, of the, the, the seawater. And so people are congregating on, along the coast. Those people need to be fed, uh, they need clean water, and they need protection from infectious diseases. All of those things also require energy, and energy is sort of the key to, to many of these things. And so while making use of the coastal environments, they're also degrading them, degrading the, the environments through habitat destruction, pollutants, toxicants of various sorts, um, and of course all of the, the uh, additional impacts of, of climate change, sea level rise, seawater incursion, and so on. So at UCSB, we're trying right now to put together a new center um, that really takes advantage of the great expertise that we have across the UC system um, to address questions uh, uh, involved in coastal health. And it's, at this point, just getting off the ground. It's going to involve um, a lot of, of grad student support as well as postdoc support. And so stay tuned. We're going to be, be, you'll be hearing more about this. The second initi initiative that I want to advertise, um, there will be a table out in the, out somewhere uh, later about it, about this which is uh, an initiative that has once again been taking advantage of the expertise that we have across the, the UC system. It's called ICICI, okay, okay acronyms, uh, which is the Institute for the Study of Ecological and Evolutionary Climate Impacts. And it's making use of the UC natural reserve system um, and making use of the fact that across the UC system, lots of people are studying the ecological and evolutionary impacts of climate change but often we do this in isolation on our, our initial, our, our sort of individual projects. There hasn't been really a good way to integrate the various projects uh, uh, and, and to sort of create something more than the, the, the individual studies. And so ICICI is trying to do this, trying to do this by taking advantage of the UC Natural Reserve System, which is a set of 39 sites across California, which allows us to, to study the impacts of climate change, comparing them across ecosystems, across habitat types, and across a pretty large uh, uh, um, latitudinal gradient. ICICI is the brainchild of Laurel Fox and Barry Sinervo from UC Santa Cruz, but it involves um, uh, grad students, postdocs, and researchers and faculty across the entire camp, uh, UC system. I just popped up here the uh, pictures of the, um, of the people on the execu executive board, uh, but there are many grad students uh, involved in it as well. And each year, uh, ICICI has been funding between one and three grad students. And so if you guys are interested in ecological and evolutionary impacts of climate change and haven't heard about this, um, these are the people you should hunt down at your various campuses to, to, uh, to get involved. And so the, uh, the goal of ICICI is to assess the ecosystem-wide impacts of climate across the UC Natural Reserve System, linking, linking plant and animal studies from oceans to mountaintops. It's had, uh, 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 some initial funding from UCLP for the first three, year, three years or so. And it has a set of specific aims about gathering and digitizing, making use of the historical data that we have at all of these sites, 
uh, trying to understand the mechanisms driving ecological and environmental uh, uh, evolutionary processes involved in climate change, trying to predict the changes to ecosystems and potential impacts to ecosystem services, and trying to inform the, the public. And so please uh, seek out the, the ICICI people uh, at their, their booth, uh, their table later today. So with that, I would thank, thank you all, and thanks to the organizers. Okay, good morning. So in an era of climate change and increasing frequency of severe weather, which species will be successful, which unsuccessful, and why? These are some of the questions that we're trying to answer in my lab, and I'm going to present a case study that's being led by a graduate student, Lauren Schiebelhut, and is a collaboration with um, faculty at UC Santa Cruz, UC Davis, and also University of Georgia. In 2013, about 90% of Oka sea stars on the west coast of North America died. Um, they died from sea star wasting disease, and this causes the um, animals to dissolve, their skeletons to dissolve, their cells to dissolve, and for the limbs to fall off. This was an outbreak of pandemic proportions. From a few sites in, California, in Oregon and Washington, within nine months, it spread throughout the whole of the west coast of the US. And if any sites in which one cared to look at um, count the numbers of sea stars, one could see a dramatic decrease in the number of individuals, between 51% and 96% of, um, in, of sea stars died at each individual site, so there's a median of 90%. A variety of researchers have worked out that this is probably due to a combination of increasing sea surface temperatures. We've seen decreases in oak sea star numbers previously with association with the large Del Nino, La Nina of the, until the current on record. And we've also seen then this outbreak of sea star wasting disease, which has led to this um, mortality in the sea stars. Of a, over a geographic range of a severity and with a rapidity that has not been um, observed previously. But all of this is history. What we're interested in is the future. So what of the surviving 10%? It turns out that if one looks at the genetics of the adult sea stars, one can see differences between those that are diseased and those that are undiseased. And so for example, here we have um, genotypes from undiseased individuals that have two different versions of a gene. Here, the diseased animals predominantly have just one version of that gene. So there are genetic differences, in, potentially, in some of the survivors. We also see that there's a great um, increase in the number of recruits that are coming into the populations. So although we've seen the adult populations decimated, we see that there's an even greater increase in the number of young that are coming into populations now. So what does all this mean for the genetics of the future generations and the potential for this species to survive for long term. There are three things that we need to know. One is which sea stars survived the outbreak. Was it only those that are protected, or was it also some of those that um, are susceptible but managed to um, avoid being um, infected by, this, by the denser virus? Or, um, and, the also, and also, the other is, um, sorry, which individuals uh, managed to, re when, when did the individuals manage to reproduce? And both of these things together will tell us which um, young larvae were produced and let out into the ocean, and then which juveniles settled into the, into the um, rocky seashore subsequently. Are these protected individuals, or are they susceptible individuals? And there is a third question, which I'll get to in a moment, which is about this problem, the larvae and the ocean and the plankton, and what happens to them. So there are essentially two extreme outcomes, and then many varieties in between. And one is that the sea star wasting disease essentially killed all of the adults that were susceptible before they had a chance to reproduce. And that would mean that very rapidly would see populations that are only those with the genes that allow them to be protected from the disease. This would be a dramatic shift in the genetics of the population. At the other extreme, we might see that um, sea stars were able to reproduce before um, the disease outbreak um, swept through the population and that possibly some of the susceptible individuals were able to avoid being infected. In this case, we would see that um, there were many, many um, recruits that were both susceptible and resistant to the disease. And in this situation, we would see rapidly that we would end up with the same kind of genetic population that we had before the disease, and so a highly susceptible population again. And that's the work that we're currently undertaking in the lab in terms of doing some genomics of, of a variety of populations from samples from before and after the outbreak. 
The third thing we need to know is essentially what happens to the larvae. So if you look at this graph that compares the adults in a population with the recruits in a population, you can see that there's no link. And this means that um, recruits are coming in from elsewhere. From where, we don't know. Right? So these larvae go out into the ocean, they'll spend about three weeks in the ocean, and then they simply come back into the coast, and we don't know where they came from or where they're going to. I likened this to a problem with trains. One might sit at a station, see trains leave, but not know where they're going to. One might see then trains arrive and people disembark and have no idea where they came from. This would not be an acceptable situation in most functional um, systems. And as an engineering colleague once uh, recently said to me, the problem with ecologists is that we only bring problems. So what I would like to do is potentially like, link towards, um, not towards a, um, a solution. One of those solutions is, of course, carbon neutrality. So we have... Um, so we can stop climate change and we can have less severe um, weather. The other is to think about how we can work out what's happening to these plankton. And so I would liken this to um, a situation where we might have um, make use of all of the information that are gathered by a variety of train spots. So it's simply looking at the trains that go through different places at different times and the directions in which they're heading. And if we were able to make a series of technologies, some kinds of drones, they're able to look at the plankton as they go past various places and to tie that into a network. And this would be a very simple, essentially, traffic problem we've seen earlier in the presentations today. One might be able to chart where the larvae are coming from and where they're going to. And this would be a technology that would be of great benefit. Mass mortality is becoming more common in um, ocean systems. And so in 2011, the harmful algal bloom essentially eradicated purple urchins from a 100-kilometer stretch of the coastline in Northern California. And again, we saw essentially all of the adults die, but we're seeing again very great potential for those populations to recover through recruitment. But this is not always going to be the case. This six rate sea star was also affected by the um, sea star wasting disease. And we've seen, uh, although we've seen not a, such a substantial decrease in the adult population, we've seen a decrease in the recruits. And so that's a, a system, that, um, a situation that cannot be. Um, perpetuated for long. Without recruits, the populations will die, the species will go extinct. So, in an era of climate change with increasingly severe weather and um, potentially exacerbating disease outbreaks, there will be species that are successful and there will be species that are unsuccessful. And working out which and why is an important job for us. And part of that will be unveiling the enigma of the plankton. Thank you. My name is Steve Allison. Uh, I'm from University of California, Irvine. And uh, there I'm a microbial ecologist. Uh, but today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, a new program, a pilot program for training graduate students as part of the, the Climate uh, Champion program. Uh, first, I wanted to thank the UC President's Office for sponsoring this initiative and for providing some seed funding to get this kind of program underway. And I probably don't have to tell this audience uh, that the climate change is a major challenge. But it's not just a big challenge, it's a complex challenge that requires uh, addressing many different components of the Earth system, from the biosphere uh, to the atmosphere and the oceans, but also how these components of the planet interact with uh, human inhabitants, interact with society, uh, policy, economics. And in order to implement climate solutions, ultimately, we're going to require interactions across these, these broad uh, segments of society and our educational system as well. So how might we begin to address this challenge? And uh, the, the idea for my uh, Climate Champion program was to address it through the knowledge of our graduate students at UC Irvine. And uh, you can maybe uh, browse this cartoon here from, from PhD Comics, but the idea is that in academia, we're really good, I think, at training students uh, in conceptual knowledge and in how to teach and in how to do these uh, academic activities. But where we sometimes fall short is in training our students to actually be able to develop and implement solutions. And in also being able to do this in a, in a very diverse workforce and pursue a wide range of career options. So it turns out I've been looking at some statistics lately. And in the environmental sciences, at least, only about 15% of our PhD students are actually going on to become academics. The rest of them are hopefully going out and to solve uh, real world problems, including problems related to climate change. So that's going to uh, set up the goal for this program, the pilot program, to prepare students, PhD students primarily, 
graduate students for careers that are related to climate change and climate solutions. So uh, the, the program is called the Climate Action Training Program, and it's targeting a small group of students at UC Irvine. And the idea here is to train students with transferable skills, so skills in quantitation, communication, policy, and interaction in inter interdisciplinary groups. And furthermore, this training hopefully will enable these students to go on to pursue careers in a diverse range of topics that apply to climate solutions and climate action. <clears throat> and in the course of doing this, the hope is to use the students as a catalyst to build new partnerships uh, between academia and uh, external organizations that are outside of, of UC Irvine. And in this way, we can bring some of those transferable skills into the university setting where it can actually influence our research directions and our training programs. So uh, this program kicked off uh, last fall. We had a committee that reviewed applications from across the campus. And we selected a very diverse cohort of these climate action uh, training students. So there are two students from uh, biological sciences, from ecology and evolution, uh, two students from urban and regional planning, uh, two English PhD students, uh, two, an anthropology student, a sociology student, and a student from mechanical and aerospace engineering. And uh, shown here is a, a picture of the students in one of the uh, training elements that we piloted a couple months ago. So it's a very interdisciplinary cohort, and it's been fun to get this group of students together and communicating across what are traditionally pretty strong disciplinary boundaries. So here are some of the specific program elements that we're uh, piloting throughout the course of 2016. <clears throat> uh, the first one, again, depicted here was a climate data science short course. So we even had the English students getting in there uh, working with computer code and processing uh, climate data. In fact, uh, one of the projects that came out of this short course was a, a team of students who analyzed, um, using Google data, the attention to the California drought and whether the, the governor's uh, drought initiatives had any impact on people's perception of drought in the state of California. Um, currently, we have an ongoing climate action seminar where we're reading uh, chapters from the IPCC's uh, third working group report which addresses uh, climate responses and solutions, um, developing internships with partner organizations. So this is a keystone element of the program, <clears throat> is to get these students working outside of uh, academic labs and out in the field. And so those internships are really going to provide some of the skills and, and the new partnerships that we want to develop. And finally, at the end of the program, this hasn't happened yet, but we're going to have a, a mini symposium where the students can come back together and interact, uh, describe their internships, and hopefully build connections across of our partners as well as uh, within UC Irvine. So here's just an example of some of those new partnerships. These are agencies or organizations that we're working with to uh, place students in intern internships with, and hopefully will ultimately provide career opportunities for some of our graduate students. So there's uh, NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, um, which is a national agency. Uh, the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project is a local water quality think tank. Um, Southern California Public Radio, which of course uh, reaches a very broad audience. Um, the UCI Sustainability Initiative, so entities within our campus, as well as some of our local uh, uh, cities, Newport Beach and Irvine. <clears throat> so looking forward, this is really a pilot program for what I hope will become a more institutionalized program at UC Irvine and other uh, research campuses. So one of the plans here is to try to scale this up by getting outside funding from the National Science Foundation, which provides uh, training grant support through a highly competitive program. But with the outcomes from this program, hopefully we can convince them that it's worth scaling up. And nonetheless, we still want to in institutionalize some of the successful program elements, like the climate data science short course, and find ways to sustain that going forward in future years, because it seemed quite useful to the students who enrolled. And that included uh, about 10 other students outside of the, the uh, climate action cohort. And finally, in the long term, we really want to be placing uh, not only these trainees, but also more generally our graduate students into careers that are uh, rewarding, fulfilling, and also addressing these complex problems like uh, climate change and climate solutions. So with that, I'll conclude and take any questions if there's time. Okay, uh, my name is Alex Hall, and I am from UCLA. I am um, a climate scientist. I, uh, my expertise is in climate modeling and climate change. And um, there's going to be a lot of discussion today about um, reduction in carbon emissions, which is um, obviously very, extremely important. Um, 
One of the things that makes climate change very challenging is that not only do we have to work on reducing carbon emissions or eliminating them, but we also have to think about climate change adaptation because we are still emitting carbon. In fact, all of us probably emitted carbon to get here uh, today. Um, and so climate change adaptation is, is really also very important. And for California, um, one of the key climate change adaptation challenges lies in the Sierra Nevada, which is where um, we get about 60% of our water resources. And I'm sure much of you, m many of you are aware of, of the, um, some of the challenges associated with that. So that's the project that I um, am working on for this um, program. Um, now, there are a lot of impacts of climate change that, um, that you're in, you know, familiar with. Um, they're all, a lot of them are listed here. Um, the issue um, that we're trying to address in the center that I run at UCLA um, is that a lot of these um, issues have been identified and they've been studied um, at continental or global scales um, and that they are, un they are understood on the, in that sense. But when it actually comes down to what happens to um, in, in, in neighborhoods, um, in particular ecosystems, we really don't have a very good handle on how climate change will, um, will impact the world. And so our goal is to bring this information down to regional scales. Um, and um, here is a, a, a swath of Southern California, um, and I'm draping on top of this the resolution of a global climate model. Um, um, which is typically 100 kilometers or so in resolution. And you can see that um, there's a lot of variation in topography and there are complex coastlines within um, one particular grid box of a global climate model. So we might, if you look, um, for example, um, in this particular grid box, it, a global climate model would, would represent this with one single number, one single temperature, one single precipitation value. But in reality, there's a lot of spatial variation in those numbers across this landscape. And so the global climate models are not appropriate tools for looking at climate change impacts. And so what we have been doing is bringing this information down to a regional scale. Um, and so here is an example of a regionalization of, of a global climate model solution that we have done for the Los Angeles region. And the way that we do this is by um, using the exact same tools that global climate models um, use, uh, the hydrodynamical equations of the atmosphere, the thermodynamical equations of the atmosphere, the land surface um, moisture and energy balances, and we, um, but we do this at very high resolution over a limited area. And in this case, we were looking at the Los Angeles region, and you can see that we bring the climate change data down to a regional scale with these techniques. So this is a two kilometer grid, and if you're familiar with the neighborhoods in Los Angeles, these are actually the neighborhoods in this particular um, part of California. Now, um, this project, um, as I mentioned, is focused on, um, oh, I wanted to show you one result from this first. Um, for the LA project, we, um, we looked at um, a lot of different aspects of climate, um, and this is um, one example of that, which is the changes in the number of extremely hot days in Southern California. Um, and um, this is just showing you the green is the current number of extremely hot days, and then the red bars are showing you how much um, those, those numbers increase um, in the future um, in the mid middle of the, of the 21st century. Um, and you can see that there are very different impacts across the region. Some neighborhoods have very um, small increases in the numbers of extremely hot days, and others have very large increases, and that's because climate change has a very differential impact across the landscape. There are some areas that are much more impacted than others, and this, that's the power of these regionalization techniques that we um, have been using. So for this project, we want to do the same thing, but for the Sierra Nevada. And um, as I mentioned, um, the motivation for this is that um, our water resources um, for the entire state are really coming mainly from the Sierra Nevada. About 60% of the resources come from that part of the, of the, of the state. And um, there is a, um, a massive um, water resource infrastructure that we have created to bring the water from the Sierra Nevada um, to areas where there's human demand for water. Um, the agricultural regions of the Central Valley, of course, um, also um, urban areas. And so when we do this high resolution modeling over the Sierras, uh, we can actually um, do watershed specific analyses of changes, um, impacts of climate change on different parts of the, of the, of the region. Um, so for example, um, um, the water that we are enjoying today comes from the Tuolumne River um, through the Hetch Hetchy um, system. And, um, and these, are the, the, these are just images that are, are, are showing us where, where, the, where the water actually comes from. And with the high resolution climate modeling over this area, 
um, we can actually make projections of the, um, of the changes in water resources in this particular watershed, and we can talk about those changes um, to, to the people who, who, are, who are actually experiencing those impacts. We can connect urban areas to, to um, the water, to their watersheds, which is, and one of the strange disconnects in California is that um, people in urban areas don't actually um, have, have much of a sense of where their water actually comes from or um, how it would be impacted by a changing climate. Um, and so um, here is just a, an overview of this project. Um, on, the, on the left is the actual um, domain of interest. We, and this is where we do our high resolution climate modeling. Um, and, um, and it stretches from the northern Sierras to the southern Sierras. And we're doing projections of climate um, for two time slices. One is a mid-century time slice, 2041 to 2060. And another is an end of century time slice, 2081 to 2100. The first time slice is meant to be um, very focused on climate change adaptation, what is actually in store. The end of century time slice is um, meant to help us talk about the benefits of climate change mitigation. Um, and so that, that's something that's um, very important for us to, to think about. We're doing two scenarios of greenhouse gas concentrations. One we call the business as usual um, scenario. That's the one that we're on. Um, and the other one is mitigation. And that's where um, the countries of the world um, come together much as we hope they will um, through the Paris Climate Agreement, for example, um, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and we're doing analyses of warming, um, snow loss, shift and timing of spring runoff, changes in drought severity, um, changes in soil moisture, among other variables. And um, I can't um, share with you the results now. I don't have time, and I also i am not ready to talk about it. Um, but I can tell you one thing, which is that significant changes in all of these metrics are inevitable um, because we are continuing to emit carbon and will no doubt continue to emit carbon for some time. Um, but there are truly dramatic changes if we don't reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the coming decades, especially by the end of the century. And um, one, of the, um, important, um, one of the important contributions we would like to make to the conversation about climate change um, is to provide information about the benefits, again, of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, this our conference is about um, innovation um, at, 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 the small, at smaller scales and then scaling that up, but government is also a partner in this process. And we have to keep um, support for um, policies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to enable innovation in the, in the private sector and, and in, at the universities. And so these are important, this is important information to, to have out there. Um, and you know, I've heard rumors, for example, that California's cap and trade program is in danger. Um, and so we need to keep these arguments um, out there. All right, um, so this project that I just described is actually funded um, by a foundation. The Climate, Cha App Climate Champion funds um, support the outreach component of the project. And so I want to talk, to talk about that piece of it. Um, so first, um, we're scientists, so we're publishing these papers in um, scientific journals, um, and it's very important that we have peer review of the methodology and the findings. Um, but in parallel with that, we're undertaking a process of stakeholder engagement. Um, so we are, um, for example, engaging with the Sierra Nevada Business Council, um, the National Park Service, um, other stakeholders in the Sierra Nevada to understand implications of the work for water resources, forests, and recreation. Just a couple of examples. And then um, that the result of that interaction will be a public report that will synthesize the findings of these projects. We're anticipating about five scientific papers coming out of the project. There will be a public report that will synthesize those um, papers and, um, for, for, um, for broader consumption. Um, and then we are also going to be producing some online education materials. Um, videos and visualizations um, to try to communicate the project to the broader public for people who don't engage in information by reading reports, which is, I think, an, a larger and larger fraction of the, of the population. Um, we're also doing media outreach. Um, there will be a media release of the public report. We'll also be preparing articles and op-eds um, that will um, help also to bring visibility to the project. Um, and we will also be doing um, um, public and policymaker outreach. Um, there are a number of public talks that we're planning um, and also um, presentations to policymakers. Um, so that, in a nutshell, is what we're up to.